all right what's going on guys your boy terror by reacts here and i'm back with some more game of thrones reaction man ah oh, man i must have the most game of thrones reactions on a channel ever <laughs> but anyways i know there's other channels out there um that react to this stuff but anyways let's jump into this man you guys have been this has been highly requested uh, from, uh probably like a couple of weeks ago somebody requested it has finally come up on the list um some of this stuff i've been i've been skipping over because some things kind of lead into some things and you know so i just do them but this has finally come around back around to this from when i did what's west of Westeros, and now we're gonna see east the strangest places in game of thrones I have no idea what's east on the map. No idea. At least I have an idea now of what's west of Westeros. Um, and a lot of people want Arya to, to go and check that out. Um, you know, oh, wants Arya to ride off into the sunset. But before we jump into that, I want to address um, some things from last video that we did i told you guys that you know you guys should go to the comment section and let me know what you think about varus okay um first of all everything that ashifex talked about in that video was all from the books pretty much um draw he drew a little bit very small stuff it's just for small stuff from video clips from the show um but most of it right most of it was from the books right so it would have been nice to see the story play out like that in the show but obviously the show went a different direction as in with Varys Varys Varys's character was very in interesting nonetheless on the show um so on the show I think Littlefinger played the better game in the books I'm not so sure Littlefinger played a better game because at this moment, according to what I'm learning from what's going on in the book, Varys is is out here just starting rebellions after rebellion. He's causing everything. Um, and I really do feel like, you know, it, that theory that um, Oshifex has from the books is very correct. He has to be in some way like related to targaryens or at least the black buyers you know what i'm saying so it's like so i'm looking at it and i'm like it, it is a possible um it is possible that he's related to either one of these families somehow some way because i mean if he's a black fire he's still technically a targaryen um so the little boy that he's taking care of, that he's grooming to become king, that him and um, that other dude, I don't remember his name, the dude that was, that took in Daenerys um, and, you know, struck the deal for, hit, for for them to marry the Dothraki along with Varys and stuff like that. So they've been working al alongside each other for a long time. Um, so that's pretty cool, man. Um, to to get to know that he's a he's kind of like a totally different person in the books because he's really just starting a bunch of chaos just to see either Daenerys on the throne, whether it was Viserys he wanted to see on the throne, or Daenerys, or the um the kid Aegon that he's taking care of, right? That they're grooming, that they're to be this great king or whatever the situation is. Um, is he going to have a oh shit moment when he finds out that John is a Targaryen? I mean, you know what I mean? Because I don't know. I don't know. Nobody knows. You know what I'm saying? Like in the books I'm talking about, like, is he going to have a oh shit moment when it's revealed in the book that he's a Targaryen, right? And he's the rightful heir to the, to the throne. So... That's very that's gonna be very interesting in the books to see how he reacts to that 
you know, having planning all of this around little Aegon or whatever, and to find out that John real name is Aegon Targaryen also, that's probably going to make him shit his pants and be like, ah, oh, shit. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know, because John is so good. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, he's like, man, I've been out here raising the perfect king, and the perfect king is already here. Yes. He's already here. <laughs> but anyways, um, you guys know that John's my favorite character, so... Um, but anyways, John has no desire to sit on the Iron Throne, obviously, so it wouldn't be a problem. I think he would do it, maybe he would do it out of just respect, you know what I'm saying? Because there's nobody else to do it, because I have a feeling that Daenerys is going to die in the books. Some way, somehow, I think she's going to die. I don't know. <laughs> it's just my, it's just me just thinking out loud. But anyways, man, let's jump into this. Um, we'll talk about it more in future videos. But that's from my opinion right now, just on what he presented. It's very, very interesting. And I'm telling you, man, the lore around Game of Thrones is so awesome. It's so awesome. It goes so deep. There's so many different things that you can think about, so many different things that you can come up with as just a theory, you know, as to what going to happen as predictions, as whatever the situation is. Um, it's easier to predict stuff that would happen in a TV show than you would be able to predict in a book, <laughs> you know, um, it's, it's harder to predict stuff because everything is kind of. Um, I want to say elongated, stretched out, fleshed out, you know what I'm saying? Um, so it's very, it's harder to predict things. You can put riddles into words. You can't read it, really put a lot of riddles into, into visual. You know what I'm saying? Like you can hide a reveal in, in visual form. Don't get me wrong. You can, but it has to be skillfully done. You get what I'm saying? For you not to pick up on it. Um, while watching, um, especially if it's a series of events that is not just one movie. Like, if you guys notice nowadays in, in, in a lot of movies, they're very predictable. Very predictable as to what's going to happen. Because, you know, you watch these type of movies over and over and over again, right? So, let's jump into this, man, before I start talking about something totally different again. Anyways, this is East, the strangest places in Game of Thrones. Hope you guys didn't mind me addressing that at the beginning of the video let's -a go most of game of thrones happens in westeros home to the starks and lannisters the wall and the iron throne but daenerys's story starts in the eastern continent of essos with the dothraki sea and slavers bay we also see bravos pentos volantis valyria in the show and calf but the world of Game of Thrones is far bigger than we see in the series. The world book describes far distant cities and kingdoms, with their own cultures, histories, and mysteries. Some of the strangest places are in the far east of Essos, and in the southern continent of Sothorios. Sothorios is full of jungle, ruined cities, and mystery. No one knows how big it is. A dragon rider once spent three years flying over the continent, but she never found its southern border said it's a land without end. <laughs> Damn. Colonies on Sothorios have all failed, and treasure hunters don't return, because the jungles are full of disease. Blood boils, sweet rot, worm bone, red death. Archmaester Ebro says that disease kills half of all Westerosi visitors, and those who survive the sickness are often killed by the wildlife. There are huge crocodiles, carnivorous fish, snakes, and basilisks and apes so huge they can kill elephants with one punch. The only <laughs> animal that isn't deadly is the purple-eyed lemur, called the Little Valyrian. Further Ooh. south, in the Green Hell regions, are said to be vampire bats that can drain a man of blood, and tattooed lizards with claws on their legs, like some kind of dinosaurs. Most terrible of all are the wyverns, which are similar to dragons. They don't breathe fire, but they're angrier to make up for it. 
Some kinds hunt in packs of a hundred, or use stealthy black scales to sneak crit their prey. And if somehow you survive the wildlife and the disease, there are slavers prowling the coast. And there are the natives of Thori, called brindled men. They're hairy, big-boned, massively muscled creatures, with noses like snouts, and thick skin like a hog coloured white and brown. Brindled men can't reproduce with other humans. The brindled men near the coast have learned to speak the local trade talk, but the men further south are said to be savage cannibals who worship dark gods. It's said that there were once lizard men and eyeless cave dwellers, old races who were destroyed or devoured by the brindled men. But the greatest mystery of Sothorios is Yeen. Yeen is a ruined city, older than time, and built from massive blocks of oily black stone. No trees or vines will touch it, it's a city so evil that not even the jungle will enter. When Princess Nymeria tried to settle some Roina in Yeen, the entire population vanished overnight. So that's Sothorios. Off its western coast are the Basilisk Isles, the festering sore of the summer sea. Hot and humid, the isles swarm with stinging flies, sand fleas, and blood worms. Old Valyria used an isle as a penal colony for their worst criminals. In their city of Gagosos, Valyrian torturers devised new torments and practiced blood sorcery, mating beasts to slave women to birth twisted, half-human children. It's actually crazy how often half-human children are mentioned in the books, it's possible that ancient interspecies breeding is what gives the Targaryens their dragon magic, and the Starks mm. their warging powers. It's also possible that some of the twisted monsters on Sothorios might have been created by Valyrian blood magic. There's some weird shit in the books. Anyway, after the <laughs> Doom, Gagosos grew rich and powerful on slavery and sorcery, until it was wiped out in a plague. Eventually, people returned, and the Isles are now home to pirates in towns with names like Sty, Whore's Gash, and Black Pudding. They have some charming local customs, like piling the skulls of their enemies on an island as an offering to some dark god. Occasionally, the free cities come to wipe out the pirates, but the pirates always come back. One time, a captain called Sothos San was sent to destroy the pirates, and he instead became a pirate king who ruled for 30 years. And that guy, Sothos San, is an ancestor of Davos's friend, Salador right. San. Right. Also, in Book 5, Barrison Selmy trains a boy from the Basilisk Isles, called Tomko Lo. And Barrison says he's the best natural swordsman he's seen since Jaime Lannister, which is high praise. One of the Basilisk Isles features an ancient idol of a gigantic toad of malignant aspect. The statue is 40 feet high, and carved of greasy black stone. The people of Toad Isle have an unpleasant fish-like aspect to their faces, and many have webbed hands and feet. So, like Yeen, this is a reference to H.P. Lovecraft, who wrote about strange fishy people worshipping strange fishy gods. These black stone structures are scattered all over the World of Thrones, and it's hinted that they were built by a Lovecraftian fish people called the Deep Ones, whose descendants apparently still live on Toad Isle. So, in conclusion, the World Book says, the Basilisk Isles are best avoided. Thousands of years ago, in the grasslands of Essos, the first civilizations began. Legend says that a silver sea was ruled by fisher queens from a floating palace. There were savage, hairy men who rode to battle on unicorns, and a city of Liber where acolytes of a spider goddess warred against those of a serpent god. It's said that there was a kingdom of centaurs, who might have just actually been mounted warriors. These are all just ancient legends, but we do know there was a kingdom called Sarnor, the Sarnori called themselves Tall Men, and they were warriors, sorcerers, and scholars. They built cities across the grasslands, with canals, caravans, and libraries, worshipping a hundred gods. Sarnori soldiers wore steel and spider silk, and rode scythed chariots, with women and men fighting together. Sarnor warred against the Carthi and the Dothraki, and even fought in Valyria's wars against Geese. The Sarnori were divided into lots of rival kingdoms, but traditionally they were ruled by a high king, 
in a wondrous palace with a thousand rooms. Legend says that the first High King was called Huzor Amai, which sounds like Azor Ahai, the hero who ended the Long Night. Many of the cultures of Essos have their own versions of this story. It's like how Noah's Ark and the Epic of Gilgamesh tell different versions of the same flood myth. Sanor dominated the West Grasslands for thousands of years, but after the doom of Valyria, the Dothraki united and attacked Sanor in force. City after city fell, and Sanor was too slow and divided to fight the threat. They were broken in a final battle called the Field of Crows, and now mm. their kingdom lies in ruins. Fewer than 20,000 tall men remain. North of Essos is a vast ocean called the Shivering Sea. It's full of fish, crabs, seals, whales, and leviathans the size of islands. Sailors also describe mermaids, and drowned spirits, and mists that can instantly freeze a whole ship. There are many reports of ice dragons, colossal beasts much bigger than regular dragons. They're made of living ice, and breathe cold instead of flame, which might explain the freezing mists. When ice dragons die, they melt, so no one can prove that they exist. In the far north is an arctic waste where the blizzards never end. Sailors describe strange lights in the sky, which might be Aurora Borealis. There are also tales of Cannibal Bay, where ships enter, then are trapped when the sea freezes behind them. It's said that a thousand ships lie entombed in Cannibal Bay, still inhabited by the children and grandchildren of their original crews, who survive by feasting on the flesh of sailors newly caught. Much of the Shivering Sea is ruled by the people of the island of Ib. The Ibanese are short, strong, and hairy, with ridged brows and massive jaws. Ibanese can sometimes reproduce with other humans, but the offspring are sterile. So, like the brindled men, the Ibanese might be another species of human, kind of like how Neanderthals lived alongside Homo sapiens in the real world for a while. The Ibanese are cunning craftsmen, hunters, and warriors who fish the Shivering Sea. Their whaling ships are renowned for their strength in weathering storms, and taking whales for bone, blubber, and oil. The island of Ib has dark forests and mountains full of bears, wolves, and mammoths. Many Ibanese live alone in these woods as foresters or miners, but others live in the main port of Ibn, in the shadow of the God King's castle, a colossal ruin that once housed a hundred Ibanese kings. Under the God Kings, Ib conquered the forests to their south, which were inhabited by a small, shy forest folk called the Ifaquevron, or the Woods Walkers. The Woods Walkers are thought to be related to the children of the forest of Westeros, the mm. Woods Walkers carved trees, like how the children carve weirwoods. But the Woods Walkers also built a settlement, or city, which is cool because we've never seen a city built by the children in Westeros. The God Kings are gone now, and Ibs ruled by a council of nobles. But the Woods Walkers are said to still live in the deeper woods, and will bless a household that leaves offerings of leaf and stone. East of Ib, we start getting into the really distant lands. Author George Martin warns us that we're seeing this world from the perspective of Westerosi maesters, whose information on distant places might not be accurate. Distortions and errors creep in, here might be dragons type stuff. So everything from here on in might be mixed with myth. East of Ib are the Thousand Islands, a scatter of bleak windswept rocks. They're inhabited by a strange, hairless people with green skin and teeth filed to sharp points. They're said to sacrifice sailors to fish-headed gods, but they're so afraid of the sea that they won't touch the water, even under threat of death. Some say that the Thousand Islands are the last remnants of a drowned kingdom, whose towns and towers were submerged thousands of years ago. So again, this stuff is straight out of H.P. Lovecraft. South of the Thousand Islands is the port city of Nefer, surrounded by cliffs and shrouded in fog. Nefer looks like a small town, but most of the city is hidden underground, so Nefer is called the Secret City, known for necromancy and torture. East of Nefer are the grim grey forests of Mosavi, a dark land of shape changers and demon hunters. These mysterious lands are as far east as any Westerosi has 
That's an ad. Yeah. So Mastering yeah. is a pain. Either you're spending time learning <laughs> complicated plugins, or you're spending money you simply don't have. The re if it was a short one, I would watch it, but it's it's, it's pain. pretty long. <laughs> Essos is divided by a great mountain range it's called like the Bones, long. named for the remains of those who try to cross them. The mountains are riddled with rivers, canyons, vast underground caverns, and sunless seas. There are passages into the mountains, ancient carved steps and hidden passages, but only a few roads lead out of the bones, the steel road, the stone road, and the sand road. Each of these are guarded by a fortress city, Kayakayanaya, Samiriana, and Bayasabad. These cities were once outposts of the kingdom of Herkun, but the lakes and rivers of Herkun dried up, reducing the kingdom to ruin. Now, only these three cities remain, defended by warrior women who believe that only those who give birth are permitted to take life. The women wear iron rings in their nipples and rubies in their cheeks, and are trained in combat from childhood. Most men in these cities are gelded and live as eunuchs. Only the strongest and handsomest men are allowed to breed and to rule the cities, making the bones a confusing mix of matriarchy and patriarchy. East of the Bones are the plains of the Jogos Nai. These guys are a bit like Dothraki, nomadic mounted warriors roaming across grasslands. But the Jogos Nai don't ride horses, they ride Zorses, which in the real world are hybrids of zebras and horses. The Zorses of Game of Thrones are similar, but tend to be tough and angry. There's a book character called Vargo Hote who rides a Zors in Westeros, he leads the brave companions who cut off Jaime Lannister's hand in Book 3. But the Jogos Nai are short and squat with pointed skulls because they bind their heads when young, which is actually a thing in the real world. Groups of Jogos Nai are ruled by a war chief and a moon singer. Usually the chiefs are men and the moon singers women, but sometimes they switch roles and live as the other gender. Because of their religion, the Jogos Nai don't kill other Jogos Nai but they constantly wage war on the peoples around them, including the Cities of the Bones. It's said that the Jogos Nai wiped out the last of the Stone Giants, which were twice as large as the Giants of Westeros, which would make them like 24 feet or 7 meters tall. The Jogos Nai also fight Yi Ti, an empire to the south. Sick of being raided, the Yi Ti have tried to wipe out the Jogos Nai, and one time they got close under Emperor Lo Bu. But a Jogos warrior woman called Zia rose up and destroyed Lobu's armies, claiming the Emperor's skull as her drinking cup. Yi Ti is the oldest and greatest of the Eastern civilizations, inspired by Imperial China. A land of hills and plains, jungles and rainforests, it's said to be so wealthy that its princes live in houses of solid gold. Its forests are dense and said to be infested with basilisks but a web of stone roads provides safe passage. The cities of Yiti are more magnificent than anywhere in Westeros. The current emperor lives in a palace that's larger than the entire city of King's Landing. So Yiti is crazy powerful, and legend says that it was once even greater. The Great Empire of the Dawn covered most of Far East Essos, with riches and armies even greater than the Valyrian Empire. The first emperor of Yi Ti was believed to be a god on earth, son of the Lion of Night and the Maiden Maid of Light. It's said that this first god emperor ruled for 10,000 years of peace, until he ascended to the stars. Yi Ti was then ruled by the Pearl Emperor, then the Jade, Tourmaline, Onyx, Topaz, and Opal Emperors, each reign more troubled than the last. Finally, the Amethyst Empress was killed and usurped by her brother, the Bloodstone Emperor. He began a reign of terror, practicing necromancy, slavery, cannibalism, and torture. He took a tiger woman for his bride and worshipped a black stone that had fallen from the sky, which might connect to the black stone of Yin and Toad Isle. It's said that the Bloodstone Emperor caused the Long Night, when the world went dark and demons attacked. Yeetish believed that the Long Night was ended by the hero Azura High. So this seems to be the same story as the Long Night in Westeros, when the White Walkers first attacked and were defeated by the last hero. 
Yi Ti even has a structure like the wall. The huge five forts protect Yi Ti from the demons of a freezing desert. So are the White Walkers of Westeros the same as the demons of Yi Ti? Also, the story of the Bloodstone Emperor is really similar to the Westerosi story of the Night's King. They both marry a monstrous woman, make themselves rulers, and worship dark forces. These seem to be like different cultures' myths of the same events. So what really happened? What caused the Long Night? And what ended it? These questions are central to the final season of Game of Thrones, and the war to prevent a second Long Night from the White Walkers. Another mystery is that the five forts are made of fused black stone. Different to the Lovecraftian oily black stone, fused stone was made by Valyrians with dragon flame. But the five forts predate Valyria, so maybe the Great Empire of the Dawn had dragons of their own. And another place with ancient fused stone is the High Tower in Westeros. Did ancient Yeetish dragon riders build the pyramid? I mean, the High Tower. We'll go down that rabbit hole in another video, but <laughs> check out Lucifer Means Lightbringer on YouTube, who goes real deep on this stuff. South of Yi Ti is the island of Leng. Its lush jungles are full of tigers and apes, and it's rich in spices and gemstones. The people of Leng are some of the tallest in the world, many reaching seven feet tall, and they have better eyesight than other humans. For most of its history, Leng was an isle of mystery, closed off to the outside world. The Empress of Leng was known to have congress with the Old Ones, gods who lived in ruined cities deep beneath Leng's jungles. Sometimes the Old Ones told the Empress to execute all the strangers on the island. That stopped when Yi Ti invaded Leng and became the dominant people. The ruined cities of the Old Ones were sealed off, but legends persist that the Old Ones still live in the darkness below. So, these old ones are another clear reference to Lovecraft. In fact, Leng is the name of a mysterious interdimensional plateau in the Lovecraft mythos. Further to the east, there's also the city of Carcosa, ruled by a yellow emperor, and Kadath, where unspeakable rites are performed for mad gods. Author George Martin has said that he added these Lovecraft references basically just to fill out the map along with places like the City of the Winged Men, Cities of the Bloodless Men, and Bone Town. So these places are just fun world building, probably not that important to the story. But there is one city that seems central to the world of ice and fire. Ashai is easternmost and southernmost, the end of the known world. Yeah. It's a huge city, bigger than King's Landing, Old Town, Volantis, and Carth combined. And Ashai is built entirely of Lovecraftian greasy black stone, making Ashai dark and gloomy even in the summer. Though the city is huge, the population is small. There are no crowds or noisy markets. People walk masked and veiled and alone. There are no children in Ashai, and no animals. Apparently they can't survive the foul pollution of the river Ash. The wider areas called the Shadowlands, where glowing ghost grass grows and dragons stir. Ashai is a center of dark magic, where red priests, blood mages, necromancers, and night walkers practice their terrible spells. Apparently, magic is stronger in Ashai, and seekers come from all over the world to learn secrets and magic. Melisandre, Quaith, Marwan, and Miri Mazdur all study magic in Ashai. Euron Greyjoy claims to have come, and seen wonders and terrors beyond imagining. The masked shadowbinders, like Melisandre and Quaith, are said to be the most sinister of all the sorcerers of Ashai. They alone dare to go up the ash, deep into the Shadowlands, where there's demons and dragons and worse. In the heart of darkness lies Stigai, the city of the night, where even shadowbinders fear to tread. So, this place seems like a cosmic center of dark magic. The Heart of Darkness is like an opposite pole to the Heart of Winter in the north of Westeros. But who built Ashai, and why build a giant city out of oily black stone? One theory is that the Bloodstone Emperor built it, because he worshipped black stone after all. Or maybe Ashai used to be normal stone, but some magical cataclysm like the Long Night transformed it. 
The polluted Shadowlands are like the fallout of some disaster, like the Doom of Valyria. Or maybe Ashai was built by the Lovecraftian Deep Ones, along with the cities beneath Lang and Yeen and the Toadstone. All these evil places seem interconnected. The darkness of Ashai runs deep. So, the world of Game of Thrones is far bigger than Westeros. It's full of exotic creatures, ancient peoples, uncomfortable race undertones, Lovecraftian horrors, and cosmic mysteries. And these same forces of ice and fire are playing out in the final season of Game of Thrones. Much of the artwork in this video is from Unseen Westeros, an exhibition of work by 40 Game of Thrones artists. You can see the exhibition for free in Berlin in January, or you can get a beautiful art book on their Kickstarter. It's got 80 pieces depicting Westeros and beyond, many never before seen. This is all non-profit, this isn't sponsored, just a celebration of the world of thrones and the artists who bring it to life. The Kickstarter is the only way to get the book, and it closes literally like today, so get it while you can. <laughs> the map in this video is by Claridox, and other artworks by Draft Urgy, Mandy Fink, San Rixian, Kevin Catalan, Oriana Weisner, Matt Olson, and more. Links are below. Most of the info from this video is from the World of Ice and Fire, which you can pick up on Amazon to support Old Shift X at no extra cost to you. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe, and thanks to the patrons, including Curtis Trotter, Simon Kerr. Alright, so there you go, guys. What's east of, of, of Westeros? Um, it's interesting. Um, I wanted to knock this video out because. Um, I want to know more about the world of Game of Thrones, you know, the world of, um, the world around the surrounding, how he built the world and stuff like that. I mean, it takes a lot, guys, to build a world in and in and in itself. It takes a lot, guys. And that's why I said this man is a genius, you know, of his generation a genius of this time for us to be experiencing something like this where it's like um we have a show we have books that can take us to to some anytime a a um a movie a tv show a book can transfer your mind to a different place they can they transcend what what it means to do those things, whether it be a movie, um, uh, a TV show, or a book. I mean, it, it's just so awesome. You know what I'm saying? Um, and I've used examples of this before. We talking about your your Harry Potter, your your um your Star Wars, your um your um even. It's Star Trek, you know, it, it's it's just you're talking about books, you know, your Tom Clancy books that, you know, that whole world is, is is interconnected. You know, even though it's different characters, it's like, don't you feel like every time you take up one of those books to read, you feel like you're transferred into a different world. And I mean, it's a gift that authors that authors have. Um that they're able to to um to transfer you into these fantasy worlds um you know and it, and it's an awesome thing man and that's why i want to know so much more about about this of course you're not going to be able to remember everything because every now and then you're going to want to watch a video over or read something back to remember these things because it's a lot of information it's like it's like you're trying to know everything about the very world that you live in. You'll never know everything about the very world that you live in because and that's why the internet is such a great thing because you don't have to remember everything anymore. Before, everything you used to have to read about if you want to know about it. Now you have the internet, you could just google.com, you know, bring up everything you need to know. Nowadays, the kids in school, they have it so much easier than us when we when I was back in school. I mean, it was it was so much harder because everything we wanted to know was in books, you know, 
and you had to go to the library, get that book, read that book. If you wanted to know about history and stuff like that, the Internet weren't as prominent back then. You know, you didn't have a Google to go at least back then. That much information was not on Google. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's just that now everything is just being transferred to Google. As a matter of fact, things Things are turned digital before it even goes to books. You know what I'm saying? Like digital platforms have priority now. When it comes on to, to books, actually, it's like the audio books drops before the actual physical copy of the book. It's crazy because it's easier. You know what I'm saying? It's easier to, 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 um, to actually get the digital copy out um, faster than the actual physical copy it's it's crazy but it's true it's just like music nowadays you don't you know what i'm saying who's going out to buy a cd not me <laughs> so that's what i'm saying it's just um so it's just so much easier so for me to get into um into game of thrones even more and deeper you know i need these kind of videos i need to watch these videos i need to read the books you know so that I can have a vast knowledge of it. If somebody says something about Game of Thrones, I can be like, well, this is my theory. And I can do it by explaining from what I've learned. Okay? So, I'm loving these videos, man. Keep them coming. Keep suggesting them. Um, somebody suggested um, that I do a couple of videos on Barristan and Sell Me. Thank you for that because nobody, and I mean nobody, has ever suggested that before. Knowing that Barrison Selmy was one of my favorite characters before he died in the show. So, um, so thank you for that. I'll be doing those with the quickness. Okay, so, um, so yeah, thank you guys for watching. And as always, man, you guys already know what to do. If this is the first time watching one of my videos, make sure to hit that subscribe button and hit that notification bell okay leave a like on the video and also leave a comment in the comment section tell me what you think about the eastern monsters and the eastern ancient cities and there was a city even greater than um valeria which is um great you know would be i mean they have so much to continue making billions. You know what I'm saying? HBO, if I was the CEO at HBO, I would be looking at all of this rich, rich history of Game of Thrones, knowing the world phenomenon that it uh, that it has become, and just start planning. For like 10, 20 years down the line, we still making Game of Thrones series, the history of Game of Thrones. What happened? in a shy how did melisandre get his pop get her powers how you know what I, what what happened all these rich theories and history of the rebellions and all the black fire rebellions and all of this other stuff that is in the in the history the the history books of game of thrones come on man you know what i'm saying there's money to be made here come on hbo get with the times get with the times i know they have some stuff planned but I'm hoping that, you know, even when I'm way up there in age, I'm able to sit down and watch a couple of Game of Thrones series videos, at least the history of Game of Thrones. It has become a, a, a central part of my life, and I'm, I'm happy about it. It's not taken over my life, but, you know, it has become a central part till it's, you know what I'm saying, like, it's a it's an escape for me you know it's an escape and that's why i like it so much because it's been a long time since i've been into a tv show as much as i've been into game of thrones and that's in part thank you to you guys you know for encouraging me to keep going and to keep the suggestions coming um so thank you guys once again and also you already know it's your boy terabyte reacts and as always, peace.